Hey, good morning all. Kip. Kip Horvath, good morning. Robin Allen, good morning. Kevin and Chris Vaughn, good morning to you. Uh, let's see here. Jumped up there. Hi, Helen England. And Ken Woods. Kathy, good to see you. Hi, Judy Martin. Judy Hatch. Tracy Crutz, good morning. Got blue skies today. Blue skies today. It's very good to see. Just checking something here. All right. Let's see here. Norma Bentley, good morning, and Janet Lyons, good morning to you. Hi, Linda Wolf, Scott Johnson, good morning to you. Hope you're all doing well today. It is uh, November 10th. This is the um, day that the Edmund Fitzgerald went down in 1975. Something that I'm um, tragedy that 29 people lost their lost their lives. But uh, if you're a fan of uh, the Great Lakes like I am, this is something that uh, and, and actually Meg and I went um, last Friday. We went up to Royal Oak. We are um, we donate money every year to the Detroit Public TV and. Um, you know, usually they give you something. So, one of the choices was uh, tickets to a, a uh, discussion by Rick Mixter, who is a um, wreckologist, um, probably one of the leading experts on wrecks in the Great Lakes. And um, so they had a patron event up there in Royal Oak at a theater, and he did a whole, oh, almost two hours on the Edmund Fitzgerald. It was really interesting. So. Norma Bentley, and let's see, oh, uh, I'm sorry, we've got to get down here a little bit. Uh, Don Jones, hello. Larry and Carolyn Thomas, hello. Nancy Horvath, hello. Doug Goddard, Joanne Butters, good to see you. I hope we have somebody here to post, either Carrie or Barry and Margo. We'll see what happens. We're at 901. So as far as uh, session met last night, and it was a very good session meeting, and uh, as far as uh, anything new going on, I just want to remind people that we've got this big event here on Saturday from 10 to 2. Um, it is the, uh, well, uh, it is the uh, craft fair that the Presbyterian women put on. And uh, it is chock full. There's not another table available, so there will be lots of crafters there. And uh, so encourage everybody uh, to stop by. And it is a masked event. Right? It is. Masks are required. So we'll see what's there. Oh, hi, Carrie. There you are. And um, Joanne Butters, hello. Hi, Doug Goddard. Okay, so we will move on here to our morning devotions. And um, our, we're going to open up. Short song, not a long one. Uh, some of our readings have been a little bit long here uh, this last couple weeks. But, um, and and hard to pronounce, right? Some of them in the Old Testament. But we're going to open up with our morning psalm, uh, and it's Psalm 15 today. So let's uh, let's take the worries and cares of the day, put them aside, and uh, just uh, soak in God's word for us today as we start this day. Or in some of us, will, some people will be watching. I just saw somebody that stopped in quickly, and they actually um, listened to every morning very early. They listened to yesterday's. So that they, as they, uh, as they go work out, so lots of people use this and different things. Not just our folks here that we see here live. So, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, good evening to you all, whenever you might be listening. But so let's uh, let's soak in God's word for us with Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right. And speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue, 
and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stated by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So, um, we are going to read, um, we are on the 10th, right? Let me just go back a little bit. I'm not going back, don't worry, Terry. I just want to check what we read. Yeah, we're nine. So, we're bouncing around a little bit in Nehemiah, just so you're aware of that. And, um, we're in chapter 7 today, and we're going to read up into chapter 8. Um, so, um, we're going to hear a little bit more about who Nehemiah and Ezra were. Because remember, Nehemiah and Ezra are contemporaneous. They're happening at the same time. Um, Nehemiah was an appointed governor of Judah that um, King Artaxerxes had appointed. And... Um, and he was Jewish, and um, he was there with uh, Artaxerxes in Babylon. And um, um, Artaxerxes noticed that he was he was um, he was sad. He said, "Why are you sad?" And he goes, "Well, I want to go back. Oh, I've got I've got some uh, got some weed whacking going on outside here. Just let it get past." Probably the last time that's got to get done this year, right? So Artaxerxes said, "Why are you Why are you so sad, Nehemiah?" And he goes, "Well, I um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing my my hometown of Jerusalem, and I know that the that it's been rebuilt, the temple, but um, the city hasn't." And he says, "Well, then go back and do that." And um, so that's where how Nehemiah gets there. And then we have Ezra, who is a priest and a scribe. Um, so he is somebody who's more concerned about what's happening on in the temple, which had been rebuilt probably 50 years ago, or had begun to be rebuilt. And Nehemiah here is more concerned with the wall that's around the city. So um, we heard about uh, the dedication of that, but here we're that we were in chapter nine yesterday, and so the, but the devotions today take us to chapter seven. So this is a little bit before that, um, but we will. Uh, We'll catch up here and see what's going on. So here we go. Our reading out of Nehemiah. Let's listen for God's word for us today. When the seventh month came, the people of Israel settled in their towns. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I'm going to stop right there. So, um, this is the this is again the the recognition of we heard about the um, uh, in chapter nine we heard about um, the repentance right that the people of Israel were providing. Uh, and that happens after this. This is actually the exposure of the people to God's word, which had been corrupted and lost. And this is the first time that this happens. This happens also uh, before the fall. Um, you know, this happens 150 years before that. Um, as they're cleaning up around the temple, they find um, this. Um, they find a, a hiding place, and they actually find the books of Moses, and they realize, oh my goodness, we've been doing this wrong. So this um, uh, recalibration um, is, this isn't unique. This happens from time to time. It happens within our churches, too, and this is why the Protestant Reformation happened. 
it's almost because we tend to get more involved with tradition right than sometimes we do with um, with what it actually says in the Bible so um, this is just another example of this that happens a long, long time ago. So here you see that Ezra is the priest, and he is reading the book, and the people are hearing it, and, it, and he reads from it for half the day, right? Uh, it talks about the water gate. There was a number of gates going into Jerusalem, including the dung gate. <laughs> so that was the gate where all the garbage was taken out and strewn. Um, so, uh, and there was the temple gate. There was, I, I'm not sure how many were there, were, but this is... We don't know where the Watergate is, other than um, we did find that they have found uh, by excavations they have found the site of where they, where where the ancient pool of Siloam was, where Jesus did some of his, some of his healings. And they think that they found that, so it would probably be a gate close to that. All right. Um, so the people stand, right? The people stand when they do this, um, and so if you go to some churches. When the gospel, when the when the reading occurs, people stand. We don't do that here in the Presbyterian Church, but you can see that this is something that comes from there. And um, the um, uh, and then they say, "Amen, amen," and the lifting up of their hands. "Amen" is Hebrew, and it really means truly or let it be. So um, we say "Amen," but it's "Amen" uh, in the Hebrew. Okay, so here we go. They bowed their heads. They worshiped the Lord's faces to the ground. And then we continue on. Also, Jeshua, Bene, Sherebiah, Jamin, Echab, uh, Shab Shabbathay, Hodiah, Masariah, Kalita, Azariah, Josebed, Hanan, Peleiah, uh, the Levites, these are so these were all the Levites right this was the tribe of Israel that uh, helped uh, around the temple now it was Aaron it was people from Aaron's descendants that were the priests but the Levites out of Levi uh, were the people that that helped kind of think of them as the sextons right the people that take care of everything help the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places so they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. I'm going to stop there. So, um, just like we're reading here, right? And I'm trying to put this into context and make the, this is this is how they were reading. This was an interactive thing. They would read and say, "Now this is could this could be what this means." Uh, okay. Continuing on, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. I stop there. Why do you think they wept? Uh, they wept because they realized uh, we're not following these. We haven't been doing this. So God's got to be uh, very upset with us. Okay. Um, and then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Pause here. So um, even though they're upset, Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites who are teaching are saying, hey, do not, right? Don't be grieved. This is a joyous day. This is the day when we're actually finding out about um, God's intention for us. So don't, don't, um, don't mourn about what has happened. Uh, live into what's coming uh, and make it a day of celebration, right? And so... Uh, eating the fat and drinking the sweet wine. That's the good stuff, right? Eat the good stuff. And by the way, uh, for people who don't have anything, go share with them. Go share with them. Okay, continuing on. On the second day, the heads of ancestral houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to the scribe Ezra in order to study the words of the law. 
And they found it written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the people of Israel should live in booths during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their towns and in Jerusalem as follows, Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them, and made booths for themselves, each on the roofs of their houses, and in their courts, and in the courts of their house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity um, made booths and lived in them. For from the days of Jeshua, son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was a very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the festival seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Well, thanks be to God. So this is the, the festival of booths, and um, this is still um, uh, practiced today in, in, the, um, in the Jewish faith. And um, back then, uh, houses uh, had flat roofs, and they actually lived, and still even today, um, um, in, the, in that whole Mediterranean area. They utilized the roofs, um, um, and um, they would build these booths using these branches. And it was really, it's the seventh month, so really what it is, it's a uh, celebration of a harvest. It's a harvest celebration, the festival of the booths. And it is in the Bible, if we read about it, and it says it's supposed to be kept seven days. All right, so move on to our Old Testament, or our New Testament revelation. We're still in 18th chapter. It's a short one, thank goodness, short one today. Um, and again, um, we're reading something that uh, when we hear Babylon, understand that we believe that that means Rome. So here we go. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Uh, Revelation 18, verse verses 21 through 24. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, With such violence, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down, and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and minstrels and of flutists and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And an artisan of any trade will be found in you no more. And the sound of the millstone will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the magnet of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in you was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. So ends this reading, the word of the Lord. So this is, um, um, th this is speaking out against Rome. And, and all of the terrible, um, uh, oppressive nature of, uh, of the Roman Empire. All right. And again, remember, it's happening at a time of uh, probably you know, right just before the time of Nero. So, you know, Nero was 115, and there was a tremendous persecution of, uh, of uh, Christians and Jewish people at that time, mostly Christians. Okay, we'll move on to Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 39. And um, so again, this is Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the final time. Um, and um, everything that's happening along this trip is to be instructive um, for his disciples. Okay, so here we go. After Jesus had left that place, he passed along the Sea of Galilee. And he went up the mountain. Hold on. And he went up the mountain where he sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing with him the lame, the maimed, the blind, the mute, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he cured them. So the crowd was amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for the crowd, because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat, 
and I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in the desert to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus asked them, How many loaves have you? They said, Seven, and a few small fish. Then, ordering the crowd to sit on the ground, uh, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all of them ate and were filled. And when they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, those who had eaten were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So this is one of the two uh, uh, miraculous feedings. There was a feeding of the 4,000 and feeding of the 5,000. This is the 4,000, but it actually was more than that because, it's, remember, it says they were 4,000 men besides women and children. So quite a few more than that, all out of seven baskets and a few fish. Um, and there's all kinds of imagery and instruction about this. Um, the seven, uh, you know, there was 12 tribes of Israel, but there were seven tribes that were in Judah. And so they're saying to say salvation for all, right, is going to come out of out of this. And um, But we also have the multiplication that, that is a true miracle here. Um, and there's been a lot of... Um, um, the thing that we're saying, that I think the big teaching here, the interpretation is the fact that, you know, um, our life in Christ and what we're giving in God is never diminished, right? It's only multiplied. So we can give everything we have, and we don't need to worry that it, we're going to be empty, right? Because here it is, is that he said, you go out, you go out and give this to them. And they do, and then they collect up everything, and got, by the way, you have more than what you started with after everybody ate. So, uh, good words for us today when we think about that. All right. All right. I'm taking a look here, see what we've got. Hi, Paul Wolf. Gary, thank you so much for posting here. Judy Martin, hello. 10 to 4 on Saturday. Okay. Thank you. I said 2. Barbara Wolf, hello. There's Barry and Margo. Good morning to you. And, as Carrie said, we are looking for Advent candles, lighters, right? So we do that on the four Sundays previous, and we start on Advent is the Sunday after um, uh, Thanksgiving. And we have four Sundays that we need to light our Advent candles. And then we also need lighters uh, for our Christmas Eve services, of which there's going to be three, right? 5.30, 7.30, and 10 o'clock. And um, so what Carrie has uh, said there, there's email constant contact so that we, people can sign up. Please, please, please sign up. There's um, Everything is done for you, right? There's a liturgy, and all you have to do is so if one person wants to read and another person wants to light the candle, that's wonderful, or do it as a family, but um, uh, many times, it doesn't matter how big a church it is, um, we go into Advent, we would love to have all those slots filled up, and rarely do we, um, but this is something that's easy to do, and it's a good thing to do as a family, or as, as a group, as friends, right, do it as the, do it as your circle, right, get your circle to do it, or, uh, do it as uh, finance and, you know, do the finance committee. The finance committee can do it. All right. There are just some ideas there. Hi, Judy Sutherland. Barbara Shute, hello. Art Hughes, hello. And Kip, that is wonderful, wonderful news for Kimmy, your daughter-in-law. We'll continue to pray for that. Okay. I think that's it. So, 9.23. The readings weren't very long today. That's great. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day that you're given us and the day that's in front of us. 
We thank you for the provisions that you gave us yesterday, and we hope that we can look back on yesterday and realize that we needed not, we need not worry about anything, that anything we needed is provided. And as we start this day, let us start it with excitement and anticipation and thankfulness. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We especially want to lift up Kimmy uh, and thank you for the strength that you have given her as she has continued to go through these surgeries and uh, this, these radiation therapies. She's reached a milestone of the last one. and Lord, we give you thanks for bringing her through this. But we, we just continue to lift up prayers for full healing for her. Lord, um, when uh, we, we're not sure about uh, our health, Lord, we're uncomfortable. So we need your we need your assurance that you are with us. And um, as we heard about the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes today, let us take that to heart to know that your you know, your grace and your mercy and your strength are never ending, and that we never need to worry about it running out. And that uh, it will only multiply if we do our jobs as disciples and turn around and, and hand it out freely to others. So Lord, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. And uh, we ask all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen all. Love you all, and, uh, and uh, God loves you. So to all of us here at Allen Park Presbyterian Church, and uh, we love to love to show you that. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful and great day in the Lord, and we'll talk to you all later on. Bye-bye.